My name is Jim Ross. I'm principal geophysicist with the OGA. I'm going to chair this session today. You'll recognize Nick Richardson to my left, up here keeping me company and thinking of tough questions for our speakers. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Christine Roche, who is a geoscientist currently working for PGS Multi-Client Northwest Europe. She's uh, worked for PGS in the reservoir group for four years and has been involved in a wide variety of projects in a number of basins worldwide. She's experienced in large-scale regional project mapping, play fairway, and interpreting important regional horizons. In addition, she's worked on basinal scale projects, understanding petroleum systems, prospectivity, and identifying leads. She now works exclusively on multi-client Northwest Europe data sets and has an in-depth knowledge of the North Sea petroleum geology and the advancements in broadband seismic data over the past number of years. Uh, okay, so good morning everybody and um, thank you for the introduction. I think that everybody is looking forward to the day ahead. Um, today I'm here to present to you a number of case studies which have been created by the Reservoir Group within PGS which highlight the use of broadband data throughout the exploration and production life cycle. So the outline of today's presentation is as follows. Firstly, I'll just talk you through the evolution of the PGS multi-client library in the North Sea and how this all fits into the current 30th round. I'll then talk you through, give you a brief introduction or for some people a reminder into the dual sensor broadband technology. But the bulk of this presentation is going to be case studies where a geostreamer has been used to identify leads and better characterize reservoirs. So firstly, a look at the library. Um, so PGS introduced the mega survey in the early 2000s and they've been adding to it ever since then to give this extensive pink coverage that you can see here. This was the first tool used by explorers to uh, give a regional, to give an insight into the regional picture of the geology of the North Sea. Then, 10 years ago now, in 2007, we had our first 2D geostreamer survey, and in 2009, we had our first 3D geostreamer survey in the North Sea that you can see here in this purple outline. And now, fast forwarding to, fast forwarding to 2013, you can see we have the addition of our Mega Survey Plus. These, these bold black outlines here. Uh, this is where PGS has taken seismic data from the field tapes and reprocessed it through modern processing workflow, giving a superior imaging of this conventional data. We also expanded our 3D GeoStreamer library with the strategy of improving knowledge in the known core areas with better technology. And while these maps are focused on the northern and central North Sea, we do actually have over 7,000 square kilometers of Mega Survey Plus data in the southern North Sea as well. So now look at the library as it stands today. So uh, even through the downturn of the past couple of years, PGS has continued to invest in its multi-client library year on year. Uh, in 2015, we acquired some new data uh, over here in the e platform. And since then, we've been working with the OGA to provide some extractions from our 3D data for their 2D lines, which they acquired to provide some well ties. Um, and we have also been doing some new acquisition and reprocessing of older geostreamer surveys to give new regional depth products. Uh, this unfilled polygon here, this is our 2017 acquisition, PGS 17003. Uh, this is going to provide over 1,600 kilometres squared of new geostreamer data in the UKCS. Um, as it stands today, this is approximately 80% complete. So as a result of this continued investment, it's now led to PGS having over 59,000 square kilometers of 3D GeoStreamer conventional mega survey and mega survey plus data um, for, and giving a vast coverage for the majority of blocks that are on offer for the 30th round. Uh, PGS have also been working with the OGA for their latest data packages release. We've um, provided 22 seismic data examples for this. Um, these are available from the OJ's website or from our own website. And we also have a few copies available with us today as well. So now moving on to the GeoStreamer technology. So with conventional data, there has always been a compromise between the depth of the streamer being towed and the um, seismic, sorry, 
the depth of the streamer and the, so the source and receiver ghost interfering with the seismic signal. So ideally, we just want this blue seismic signal here without any interference from the source or the receiver. We want this spectrum here to be as broad as possible without any notches from the source and receiver. So PGS have developed a streamer with co-located hydrophones or geophones along the same streamer or geostreamer. This means that we are now recording two measurements of the seismic wave field at the same location, and we can then perform a seismic wave field separation to completely remove the ghost. And now that the ghost is completely removed, it removes the limitations for the depth of the streamer can be told, which means that we are maximizing the frequencies, uh, the, both the low and the high frequencies, to give an improved seismic resolution throughout the section. So the reason that we want to um, expand the uh, frequencies is for when it comes to interpreting absolute elastic properties, and we want the frequencies down to zero hertz. So the gap in the low frequency model here is usually filled with a combination of seismic velocity and well information. But now, now that we have this increased bandwidth, it means that we are relying less on well and well information which has been interpolated from the well logs and it's more data driven than model driven. Uh, this reduces your risk and increases your probability of success as decisions are being made based on data rather than model or a priori information. So now moving on to take a look at the case studies. So firstly, an example of why we need reliable pre-stack AVO information. So here we have um, the Mariner field, which we've already seen a few slides of already, um, and we can use geostreamer data to identify reservoirs which are not often seen in the full stack. Um, down here, this lower section, this is a relative acoustic impedance section. This has been derived directly from the data. There's been no well information and uh, no interpretation pla taking place here. It's just derived directly from the data. Um, down here in the bottom right, we can see the Maureen Reservoir of the Mariner Field as a hard red kick in soft, in, in, encased in some softer blue-green shells. But the overlying Heimdall Reservoir here, um, these are not seen in either the full stack or the relative acoustic impedance. Um, so now, using our reliable pre-stack and AVO information, we can create an AVO attribute volume, which now highlights the hydrocarbon saturation I should, sorry, I should have mentioned that the well logs here are showing hydrocarbon saturation with the red intervals representing hydrocarbon bearing section. So again, on the upper section, we can see that there is a good match between the uh, large red negative values and the hydrocarbon bearing sands. So to identify uh, the best leads and prospects, the best quality data sets are needed, and using broadband data, we are now getting an improved imaging of the deeper structures. Uh, we're also having a, an overall geological picture which is more truthfully representative of the geology of an area, with much less side lobes and more low frequency events. So this is just an arbitrary line from west to east through the Viking Graben, and as you can see, there is an improved level of detail at all stratigraphic intervals. Um, including over here, we have some well-imaged Paleozoic section and some potential tertiary injectites in the shallower section. So the true value of the data now comes into play when we start looking at the data set in pre-stack. Um, so these fans are from the, approximately the same location as the previous full stack line. Um, these sands are part of the Upper Jurassic Bray Sands play, where we have sands and conglomerates coming down into the basin from the East Shetland platform in the west, which is being uplifted. And uh, this area is considered to be mature and fully explored, but actually all the fields in this general area are more proximal to the basin margin, and these sands are much more distal. They're equivalent of the Miller and the Kingfisher fields. Um, so. Here we can see these um, impedance anomalies coming into the basin in these really distinctive fan shapes. And when we look at these in the cross section, we can see that these are nicely encased by the softer shells. So these fans are actually in open acreage for the 30th round. Um, so now we have an example from our barrel embayment data set where tertiary injectites are being marked out by low VPVS anomalies in, ac across this data set. 
a combination of VPVS and relative acoustic impedance can be used to identify and de-risk tertiary injectile play. Um, here on the left hand side we have some known reservoirs um, of producing fields in the area um, and on the right hand side we have these um, distinct linear, um, linear meandering belts of lowish VPVS um, and you can see also there's um, some wells been drilled in here but these have just missed the injectile play and these were targeting deeper Jurassic objectives at the time. So at the moment we're looking at this um, prospect here in the middle um, th I think that this is going to be the most promising and I'm just going to show you across this section these three features A, B and C um, in just to take a look at these in a more closer look. Um, so if we firstly look at the relative VPVS and we have used this to identify the top and the base of each of the features in A, B and C. So firstly looking at feature A, we can see that this has been mapped out very nicely in the relative VPVS. And now when we're looking at the impedance section, the upper portion of feature A here is a much lower, is a much lower impedance than the bottom section and you could nearly potentially hazard a guess that this uh, would be a potential hydrocarbon water contact here that we interpret these the low VPVS combined with the low um, relative the low impedance here to be representative of hydrocarbon bearing sands within this feature. Uh, moving on to take a look at feature B, and here we have the typical dish-shaped geometry injectite that uh, we all are looking at all the time. Um, when we look at this in the VPVS, we have this really strong response, but the impedance response here is not as convincing as it was in feature A, and therefore this would significantly increase the risk of this prospect. Uh, moving on to feature C, and we do have a really good response in the VPVS here, but when it comes to the impedance, we would interpret these to be water-bearing sands. So moving on to the appraisal and development phase. Um, so here we have a field where Geostreamer has been used to identify significant near-field reserves in this case. Um, so first of all, this uh, map here shows a window of minimum VPVS below top 40s. Um, and the cross sections here, you can see this low VPVS anomaly. Um, the top and the base of the reservoir have been interpreted here. So if we just um, isolate this to within the boundary of the field itself, um, seismic driven pre-stack conversion combined with some knowledge of the rock physics uh, means that we can identify these hydrocarbon bearing sands this is the main pay area of the field, which is currently being produced. Um, we can see that this area to the east is likely to be a bit more disappointing than the main pay area at the moment. But um, the good news is that we can see a likely continuation of hydrocarbon bearing sands to the south of this prominent west-east fault in the field. And this was considered to be um, a major risk. Now, when we look at the wider picture again, we can see that there is potent there's potential for really near field upside reserves here with similar VPVS response um, outside of the field boundary with a really significant potential down here in the, in the southeast. So in this case, um, Geostreamer has shown that there's actually um, more potential in this field than has initially been declared by the operator. And in fact, we know that the initial reserves declared by the operator have already been produced and production still continues. Three minutes. Um, so now moving on to an example of a field which is likely to have overestimated reserves. Um, so here again we have this nice VPVS response in the cross section and in map view this has been mapped out as a geobody. You'll also see the outline of the field here in the bold black outline. And this field has been produced by three horizontal wells that you can see here. And this southern horizontal well has um, in fact been a very poor producer for the for the field and this bit given very disappointing results and hopefully we can see why by looking at this at this example. Um, so this field is actually now being abandoned 16 years early and had they had this information prior to well prior to this stage then maybe it would have led to a different decision being made earlier on in the process. Um, so in a mature area such as the North Sea, it is really important to identify near field opportunities which can add life to and add value to your existing fields and infrastructure. 
Um, so here we have the outline of a known producing field here. Uh, this surface is a window, again, of minimum VPVS across the Brent group. Uh, we interpret these red sands to be uh, hydrocarbon-bearing sands within the Brent group itself. Um, so this is our known producing field here. We can see that the VPVS response corresponds nicely to the field outline. Uh, we can see this again here in um, cross-section. And you'll notice now to the immediate east of this, there is a really nice structural closure, again with a very similar VPVS response as seen in the neighbouring field. Um, this uh, potential satellite is actually now in open acreage for the round. Again now to the west of this, within a five kilometre range, we have another really nice structural feature, again with a very similar VPVS response. So it's identifying these opportunities which are really important to add life and value to your existing fields and infrastructure. So this is it now, my summary. So I hope that the past couple of case studies have shown you the value that Geostreamer can add from looking for those difficult yet to find reservoirs and unlocking those remaining barrels um, to making some correct decisions based on data rather than model or a priori information when it comes to appraisal and development. Um, and also the potential that Geostreamer has to identify these near field um, exploration opportunities. So as I mentioned, PGS has um, a vast coverage over the vast majority of blocks which are available for the 30th round. We do have most of our data sets here today, so if anybody would like to come and chat to us afterwards, we'd be happy to show you. So thank you very much for listening.